his way. Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucker, he's on his way. Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Listener discretion is advised. The show contains graphic language and depictions of violence. It may not be suitable for all audiences. We say fuck a lot. Welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. How's it going, Dylan? I'm doing wonderful. You're doing wonderful? Yeah, how are you? I'm fantastic. Ooh, I can tell. <laughs> Let's start the show by thanking our lovely patrons who joined us at patreon.com slash Mountain Murders Podcast. Yes, I'd like to thank Emily, Michelle, and Rejected Driftwood. They are sponsoring today's case. Are you ready to get started? Let's dive in. Let's not waste any time, Dylan. Richard Mark Evenitz, known as Mark, was by all outward appearances a normal guy. He was reasonably attractive, well-groomed, and dressed nicely. The eight-year Navy veteran was just another guy next door hosting cookouts, drinking beer with the neighbors, and even became president of his homeowners association. Well, he sounds like the kind of guy you would like to be neighbors with. But as we've learned, things are not always what they seem. Often monsters are hiding behind the white picket fence. Is that a good dateline intro? Because I was really trying. Oh my god. I thought I was I thought we swapped over the dateline for a minute. Okay. <laughs> So I get a thumbs up on the Dateline intro? Yeah, I'm totally going to be like, that was very cliche, but well placed. No, it needs to be like very dramatic. Often monsters are hiding behind the white picket fence. Yes, that's perfect. Okay. Mark was born in Columbia, South Carolina on July 29th of 1963. His mother was Hester, known as Tess, and his father was named Joe Evenitz. Now the pair met at Fort Jackson where Joe was in the army. Tess had a civil service job, and though Joe was stationed at Fort Campbell, he was on a temporary assignment to Fort Jackson. Immediately, the two were attracted to, to one another, and an office romance bloomed. Ooh, it's like the first time I met you. Yeah, I remember that. Office romance bloomed? Well, it wasn't in an office, but uh, I was instantly attracted. Ooh, baby. That sounds like a stupid story. Let's move along. It's a real story. On December 6th of 1961, the young couple wed in a Methodist church in Lexington, South Carolina. Joe was discharged from the Army in 1962, at which time they returned to Joe's hometown in New Jersey, where they moved into his mother's garage apartment. Soon after moving to New Jersey, Joe was fired from his job. He asked Tess to call her parents, beg them to send some money. But instead, her parents drove to New Jersey and picked up their daughter. She returned to South Carolina where Mark was born. Soon after Mark's birth, the couple realized the marriage was a huge mistake. Well, um, that's uh, not a good time to realize that. <laughs> I see you got to get married for the right reasons, right? Yeah, Joe couldn't hold down a job. He began drinking. His drinking worsened, causing him to lose job after job. Despite the unstable home life, Mark was a smart baby. By two, the family had moved again back to New Jersey. And in 1968, the Evenets welcomed another baby, a little girl named Kristen. Mark loved being a big brother and adored the baby. He thought everything she did was hilarious. Oh, what a good little big brother. By 1969, the family had once again moved back to South Carolina after Joe lost another job. Mark was eight years old in 1971 when the family added another daughter, Jennifer, to the mix. Yeah, see, these are some pretty big moves. It's not like they're moving, you know, just across town or, you know, in the same county. They're moving states away. So that can really add a lot of pressure and just, um, what? tumultual what tumultuousness is that a word <laughs> <laughs> sure it can unsettle the family you know and it's hard for everybody to get back in their groove by this time tess had emotionally checked out of the marriage joe was drinking and had become violent at home joe was a miserable drunk who was often set off by the slightest infractions no one was safe he'd call his children morons and peons 
Yeah, you know, when uh, someone has, uh, I saw this the other day, and I'm afraid I'm, I've been subjugated to this or subjected to this. I'm trying to be too smart today. I need to calm down. If someone, if you have a very intense argument with someone and that other person quickly recovers or say you wake up the next day and they act like nothing happened, you know why that is? That person can do that because they're used to chaos. They've been through this so many times before. It's no big thing for their brain just to flip it back over and be like, okay, we'll act like that didn't happen. And that's not a good sign. That's not, that's a sign of stuff they need to work on themselves. You think I'm like that? I'm, I think we're both like that. I think we're both like that. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because we both grew up in chaotic homes? I believe it may be. Probably. He was also physically abusive. When Tess was pregnant with Jennifer, an incident escalated, which caused Kristen to be treated at the hospital with a head injury. Well, that sounds like a fairly significant escalation. Mark could often escape punishments by outrunning his father. For his own self-preservation, Mark became a quiet, studious kid. He read the family's entire encyclopedia set. Well, that's a lot of information to go through. I always love this encyclopedias because you'd be looking for one thing and you'd stumble across some other cool fact while you're looking through it. Exactly. I kind of miss having those gigantic encyclopedia sets. And I honestly think kids miss out on the very fact of using an encyclopedia to, you know, look up stuff because they may discover things along the way. Well, I was going to ask you right quick. Did you run from spankings when you were a kid or did you just face the music? I tried a few times, but then I got snatched up. Yeah. It didn't always work out in my favor. Yeah, I tried. eventually, you've got to come home. <laughs> like when it gets dark? Yeah. Yeah, I've tried that a few times, and it did not work out. But I did do the patented run in a circle when they start beating your ass. Oh, yeah. It's like the little dance you do. And they got you by one arm, and son, you're running like it's a 40-yard dash. Yeah. And they're just a swarping with that switch. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Hashtag dysfunctional. Oh, well, uh, you know, that could just be hashtag, uh, you know, I didn't I'm, I didn't mess around when I was an adult because I remember getting my ass whooped. Well, there's that too, I yeah. guess. I guess you can see the positive in that. You got to switch. There's a Silver little. Silver lining it's in like the beatings. The, I don't know. It's like a strike zone. You got the ass whooping zone where you're okay to strike a child, but you got to stay in somewhere around that butt area. Yeah, you can't be hitting them up in the back and stuff, and you can't be just tearing their legs up. Yeah, so it's like a whooping zone. Why do I feel like we're going to get a lot of emails regarding this topic, Dylan? I feel like our listeners, some of our listeners, maybe many of them have had their ass busted when they were kids. Probably. We have naughty listeners. Ooh. Some of them are probably getting their ass busted as adults, too. Ooh, maybe they want their ass busted right now. Yeah, do you? Call me. Okay. He played Little League. He was a Boy Scout. He liked to skateboard. So he kind of did the normal kid stuff. During one terrible altercation, Joe took Mark's beloved dog and drowned the pet in front of his son, causing great trauma in Mark. Yeah, see, that's way beyond. That's sadistic. I mean, that could mess a kid up for the rest of their lives and for one and killing an animal like that the dog didn't do anything later in life mark would claim that joe attempted to drown him in the bathtub when he was six years old and by 12 mark began drinking and smoking however his grades didn't suffer and though the family moved frequently the cycle was always joe losing his job the money would run out they'd get evicted and they'd have to move again yeah un un instability that's not good for any home and as he grew older mark built a wall around himself to hold in the secrets which i think a lot of us kids who grow up in abuse or have maybe alcoholic parents abusive parents tend to do that yeah i think um an alcoholic parent is is a very specific type of dysfunctional parent to have even if your parent may have used some other substance or something like that, and that comes with its own problems. But children of alcoholic parents grow up to act a certain way, to accept people's outbursts and things like that, because it's like it's a, at the drop of a hat. You never know. It's like you're walking on eggshells. You're never, even when things are okay, you're always wondering when they're going to go bad. Well, it's kind of like, I think, growing up in domestic violence. 
I would say it's very similar. Very similar. And I think kids who grow up with these issues at home, this kind of dysfunction, you do have a tendency to build a wall up and you know what secrets to keep, what's acceptable to talk about, and what you don't talk about. Yes, definitely. It was said that at age 13, Mark began making obscene phone calls. Mark graduated from Irmo High School when he was 16, and this was in 1980. So smart enough to graduate pretty early. Well, that's what, pushing two, right at two years early, right? There was also some speculation that when Mark was 16, he molested his younger sister. But I couldn't find definitive proof of this. But it has been suggested. Though Mark showed academic promise, he spent the next few years working a series of unsatisfying jobs. While employed at Jiffy Lube, he met a guy named Billy, who had recently been paroled after serving seven years in prison for armed robbery. The two were drinking, doing drugs together. Mark was breaking into houses. He stole valuable coins from a neighbor and later denied this, though his mother and sister would find the coins years later. Oh, so there's proof that he actually did do it. Yeah, like 15 years later, they find these coins stashed, like in the attic. What the hell? And they're like, he fucking stole these. He was lying back then. Yes. He began passing bad checks. And when he was arrested for passing a bad check at the local Kmart, I believe it was for $350, he was facing some legal trouble. Joe gave his son a choice, join the military or be out in the streets. Well, yeah, I think that's not an uncommon choice to uh, unruly kids back in the day, especially. Mark enlisted in the United States Navy, where he became a sonar technician. In February of 1984, Mark attended basic training in San Diego, California. While Mark was away, his mother, Tess, began a phone relationship with a man named Perry Devereaux. Devereaux was in prison for the 1975 rape and murder of a South Carolina woman. Since her marriage was horrendous, the charming inmate managed to woo a lonely Tess. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, not everyone in prison is a terrible person, but uh, you say he was on, uh, what was he in there for? Rape and murder. Okay, so those are the terrible crimes. Those are bad. How do you get past those? She was working for the phone company and somehow began speaking to him regularly on the phone line. Ooh. Started this relationship with him. Yeah, it seems like rape, murder, molestation would be the three things that I really couldn't look past a man or a woman having done any of those, right? I mean, I guess there's really particular circumstances on the murder thing that, well, it was this way. It's not like, you know, I mean, I guess there's gray area a bit, but... Well, well you're not single right now, but I'm just speculating. I'm going out on a limb here, Dylan. Dating in 2021, I think a lot of women have the bar set very, very low. Well, I'll tell you what. At I could, least if he's on death row or he's serving a life sentence, you know where he is at all times. You do know where he is, and you know that in the, he's likely gamefully employed, right? And um, you know where you always say that. You know where he is and what he's doing. He's not out running the streets. No, he is not out there he's making it happen. He's not out having sex with your best friend behind your back. Yeah, but I just uh, rape. And spending it. your money. Rape and murder. Well, I know. I could never, but apparently Tess was into this. She finally divorced Joe and then marries Perry, who, again, I mean, he's serving a life sentence for rape and murder. So as far as she knows, he'll always be in prison. Yes. Okay. Joe moved to Virginia and ended up marrying an Ethiopian immigrant. So this is happening while Mark is away at basic training. Seems like a lot's going on while he's gone to basic training. Definitely. So after training, Mark was stationed at Naval Air Station Mayport, which is in Jacksonville, Florida, and he was attached to the USS Kolsch. During his time in Florida, he aided in the recovery of the crash Challenger spacecraft. Oh, wow. That was a big... Uh... That was a big deal. Yeah, being a sonar tech. Yeah, that would I'd be proud of that. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. January 3rd of 1987, a 15-year-old named Kelly Ballard was walking with her three-year-old sister, and this was around 4.30 p.m., when a four-door 1974 Dodge with South Carolina plates pulled up, stopping in front of Kelly. She's on the sidewalk, middle of the street, neighborhood where she lives, right? 
inside the vehicle, Kelly saw a man masturbating in front of her. That's so disgusting. Well, she freaks out, grabs up her little sister, runs away, right? So the following day, Kelly sees him go into a video store while she's out shopping with her mother. She sees the guy. She sees him, yep. Sees the car. So the two contact police and they give law enforcement the Dodge's tag number. Law enforcement was able to trace the owner to the USS Kolsch. Oh my goodness. So it's Mark. But it was too late. The ship had gone out to sea for training. So by February, an arrest warrant was issued for lewd and lascivious acts in front of a minor. However, Mark was admitted to the base hospital for hepatitis as soon as the ship came back in. And that's where he was arrested. So they were just waiting for him to come back in and they were going to get him. Yeah. Yeah. Peeping and exposing yourself in public are very, very deviant behaviors, in my opinion, that may mean a test to the fact that you have very uh, much deeper mental problems and issues. It seems to me a person who has no impulse control. Yeah, I would say even beyond that, it's like a person who just likes the shock factor of it, you know, especially exposing yourself, because if you're peeping, I guess you're being secretive. But yeah, I mean, it's just a, I don't know. I'm not sure what kind of feedback they get from people, because nobody's going to be like, hey, cool, you're exposing yourself to me. You know what I mean? Like, it's always going to be this certain type of a very strong reaction. And then you're here you are in public. And well, it's like the whole dude walking around with an overcoat and just opening it and flashing people. Well, I think they want that shock factor. That's why I've always been of the mindset. If I saw someone doing this, I would just point and laugh. So you were not, you're not going to be shocked at all. And you're just going to make fun of them. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to humiliate them. Yeah. You're just going to be like, ah, look at it. It's so cute. Ha ha. It's so, it doesn't look like it can please me. Look at you. Yeah. Should, can I see that again? Yeah. Let me see. Open that back up. I, I can't even tell what that is. Yeah. I'm not sure. Is that a second belly button? Is that a planter's peanut? <laughs> wow. Once in police custody, Mark confessed to masturbating in front of the young girl, saying he definitely had a problem and he just couldn't control himself. June 30th of 1987, a judge sentenced Mark to three years probation and a $252 fine. He was ordered to undergo a mental evaluation. He was also registered as a sex offender in Florida. His legal troubles prevented him from being promoted. He was demoted from his rank as a first-class petty officer, which is an E6. And by the time he finished up his eight-year enlistment, he was only a second-class petty officer, which is an E5. So he got knocked down another level. Yeah, he was knocked down a couple of ranks and only managed to pick up second class by the time he got his his honorable discharge. And so that's going to affect, number one, I guess the people around you are going to be like, oh, look at this, so this guy. But it's going to affect your money as well, right? Your yeah, pay. Yeah, definitely. If you were to stay in there, it's going to affect your retirement. And so it affects a lot. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. He was also ordered into a rehab program for alcohol in 1988. Mark never told his family about the sex crime. Bonnie Gower was a friend of Mark's younger sister. She was 16 years old in 1988, and Bonnie had a huge crush on Mark, writing him letters when he joined the Navy. They dated on and off when he was home on leave. It was in August of 1988 that 25-year-old Mark and 16-year-old Bonnie decided to get married. Oh, you say 16? 16. Oh, again, I just don't get it. Bonnie, being young and naive, had no inkling that her husband's sexual proclivities were unusual as he regularly tied her up, blindfolded her, and would often rape her for three to four hours at a time. Yeah, I think that goes... Uh... A little bit beyond just some role playing and light bondage. I mean, hey, I'm all for people doing what they want. But here you have this young girl who's maybe, maybe this is the first guy she's been with at 16 years old, quite possible. Certainly had limited contact if she's had any sexual contact. And she just doesn't realize this is abnormal. And so he's just doing all this strange stuff to her and. Maybe she thinks this is what it's like being with a guy. Well, this is my husband. I'm supposed to do what he wants. This is how I'm supposed to please him. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, the couple was transferred to Maine in 1989 and then back to San Diego. Bonnie had a strained relationship with her mother-in-law, Tess. Tess thought that Bonnie was immature, self-centered, and a pretty lousy housekeeper. Well, she's 16. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe she's a... She's just... Maybe Tess should think about why did my son, who is, what, 25? Why did he marry a 16-year-old? Why is he the one that's immature and can't connect with women anywhere near his age? Seems like the burning question, Dylan. Yeah, and then you're in the military. It's not like you can't have an opportunity to meet somebody, right? Right. And Jennifer, when they were stationed in California, his younger sister Jennifer actually stayed with them for a while and was living in their apartment with them. By November of 1992, Mark had give, was given an honorable discharge from the U.S. Navy, so the couple headed back to South Carolina. They wouldn't live there for very long. Bonnie had gotten her cosmetology license in California, but South Carolina was very stringent in their board certification. Virginia was a more welcoming state for Bonnie, so the couple moved to Spons- Spotsylvania, Virginia in 1993. Mark found work at uh, Kesar Compressors, which is in Fredericksburg, Virginia. He worked a technical job in the applications department. Coworkers would describe Mark as cocky and rude. Female employees at Kesar avoided him as he often made off-color comments, degrading sexual remarks, and vulgar jokes. Well, yeah, and he probably gives them the creep vibe on top of all that bad behavior. I'm sure. And his attitude with customers was equally appalling. He had clear problems with anger management. And by 1995, he was working at a different company, Walter's Grinders, which was like a machine tools company. It was in June of 1995 that two sisters, aged 11 and 13, were home alone after school in Spotsylvania when a man broke into the home with a gun and handcuffs. He locked the 11-year-old girl in the bathroom, then handcuffed and raped the 13-year-old. When he was done, he fled the home. My God. This rape would be unsolved for a number of years. Really? We'll get into more of that in a minute. Bonnie and Mark bought a house in the South Oak subdivision of Spotsylvania, It was a custom white house with blue shutters. In their new home, the even it settled into the neighborhood. Mark would often lend a helping hand. He was known to all around, you know, as a nice guy. Bonnie was a little bit older now. She was working a job like in a salon as a cosmetologist. And she started seeing that her sex life with Mark was not normal. Well, I guarantee you. Just like the barber shop, she's going to hear the women talk there in the salon. And, you know, she's going to probably hear some salacious stories or, you know, funny stories or whatever. Or even weird stories, I'm sure, to a degree. I don't know how women talk. But I'm, I know Locker you... Locker room talk. Well, <laughs> I know I know that uh, actually you guys... Um, gals talk about... Uh, I think they're dirtier minded than men. They yeah, just hide I'm it Yeah, I'm just better. like, I just grab them by the dick. Yeah, they just hide it better. I just creep up on them like the bitch that they are and just grab them by the dick. <laughs> it's just the stuff I talk about with my girls. Ooh, you talk to people about... It's just locker room talk. Like that about me? Yeah. like that's... It's actually what I said to Billy Bush on that bus when they recorded me. But it was just locker room talk. <laughs> oh, my goodness. No, but and so she's probably hearing stories, hearing people talk about their sex lives to a degree. And it's probably nothing as strange as uh, what hers, her everyday sex life is probably like. Yeah, she's starting to realize that, like, hmm, things are not what they should be in this marriage. There seems to be an imbalance of power, especially when it comes to the bedroom activities. Yeah, and she's older and maybe a little wiser now. Mark was experiencing some sexual issues, including impotency at this time. Feeling lonely and unsatisfied, Bonnie turned her attentions to meeting people in online chat rooms. And by August of 1996, Bonnie had met someone, a man who lived in California. She packed a suitcase, informing Mark she was leaving him and should be back sometime to get the rest of her belongings. Oh, so she just had enough, huh? Yep, hits the road. Sophia Silva was a junior at Cortland High School. 
She radiated charisma and was described as a genuinely nice person who was a popular member of the dance and drill team. The striking brunette had long hair, she was really cute, and everybody just was really crazy about her. She was close to her parents. She and her dad enjoyed watching baseball together. Sophia was a huge Atlanta Braves fan. On the afternoon of Sept- September 9th, 1996, Sophia went to check the newspaper box in front of her house when a green Ford Taurus pulled up to the curb. Mark Evenitz jumped out of the car, grabbed Sophia, shoved a rag in her mouth, slapped a pair of handcuffs on the girl. Moving fast, he tossed her into the back seat of the car and sped away. When she tried to fight back, Mark hit her several times in the head. So it's a straight up abduction right in front of her home. Right in front of her house. And this is a fairly, um, you know, uh, busy residential type of neighborhood. I mean, there's these houses are like right on top of each other, subdivision type of neighborhood. Right. So that was, he was taking a huge chance committing this crime here in this setting, right? Yeah. I mean, this is not like she lives on some rural street. Neighbors were surprised to see Mark driving fast through the neighborhood, barely missing children in the streets. He pulled his car around, backed into his driveway, and into the garage. His driving was so erratic that one neighbor walked over to the house. When the neighbor knocked on the door to tell Mark, hey, you need to slow down, man, there are kids in this neighborhood, the man, meaning Mark, answered the door and gruffly said, I can't talk right now. So he, it sounds like he's drove crazy all the way from wherever he's abducted her. And he's going straight back to his home, which is now empty because his wife's left him, correct? Ah, he's like, I can't talk right now. I'm doing psycho guy shit. And then slams the door in the neighbor's face. Jesus Christ. Mark dragged Sophia to his bed where he tied the girl up. This is, I don't know why this disturbs me. He then shaved her pubic area and attempted to rape her. But due to his erectile dysfunction, it didn't go as he planned. So frustrated, Mark strangles the girl. He then wraps her up in a blue blanket, tying ropes around the body using nautical knots. Like very precise types of knots. So I guess I assumed um, maybe that he had assaulted those young girls and raped an 11-year-old? 13. 13-year-old. And um, I thought maybe his issues with his impotence in his wife and their relationship now was connected that he'd went that far. You know, he'd went, that's what really turned him on was really raping someone. He'd been acting like he's raping her or whatever you want to call that. But then it seems like he really has some kind of issue that even when he's doing this horrible thing again, his penis is not working. Right. And then he just turns around and murders this girl. Poor girl, which I'm sure was his intention the whole time. Mark then tossed her in the trunk of his car, drove out of the garage, and got on the highway um, heading to King George County in Virginia, which is about 30 miles away from where he was living in Spotsylvania. When Mark finds a rural area, it's actually by a flower farm called Dominion Growers, he throws Sophia's body down this embankment and into some water below. The day after Sophia's murder, which is September the 10th, Mark calls in sick at his job. Well, by now, Sophia's parents are fraught with worry. Sophia's friends knew she would never run away from home. So by the 12th, a major search effort had been launched. Hundreds of volunteers combed the surrounding areas looking for the missing girl. America's Most Wanted featured a segment on her disappearance during their September 14th broadcast. A ton of leads poured in, of course, after a disappearance on America's Most Wanted. Law enforcement has to follow up on these tips. So well-meaning people call in, but often it leaves investigators stretched thin. So for a month, uh, a month or more, Sophia's parents were beside themselves hoping for answers while the cops are trying to chase down all of the leads that had poured in. Yeah, I mean, that type of exposure, I mean, they do it hoping that someone something will shake loose. But more times than not, they get more information, people meaning well, like you said. But, you know, I thought I saw her here, you know, supposed um, spotting her at the grocery store or whatever. And uh, and the cops literally got chased every single one of those leads down, I guess, with the hopes of one of these will actually turn into a real solid lead. 
But a lot of times that always almost hurts the investigation in a way. But, I mean, obviously they only do that when they're pretty much a cold case. October the 16th, a road worker spotted a bundle floating in Birchwood Creek. When he went to check on it, he discovered it was a body. It was a badly decomposed body, by the way, and it would later be identified as Sophia Silva. There were no leads in the case, leaving police scrambling. After Sophia's appearance on TV, it had become a pretty high-profile case in the region. All eyes on this missing girl. Man, I'm telling you what, I guess he'll never forget discovering that bundle there in that water. Mark worked out regularly at a gym with a friend, and he would often make the friend feel uncomfortable by commenting on young girls' appearances. What I'd give for a taste of that. And his friend, Repulse, would say, we're old, you need to date someone your own age. And Mark would say, but I like them young. Yeah, that's. I would stop being friends with that guy if he consistently said things like this. Because anyone that says that all the time, they mean it. And I would just be like, dude. I don't want to be around someone like that. Well, and the friend was like, his wife just left him. So I can understand that he's feeling lonely, maybe on the prowl a little bit. But, you know, in the months that Bonnie's been gone, I mean, he's very often talking about underage girls. Yeah, I would find that very... um, Unsettling. Very unsettling. and Creepy. Yeah, yeah, and creepy. Yeah. (laughs) I would make me not be friends with that guy if he kept that up. By November, Bonnie had returned from California. Though she briefly considered rekindling her relationship with Mark around Thanksgiving, she swiftly changed her mind when Mark became violent. She packed up her belongings, heading back to California permanently. Mark fell into a deep depression after the dissolution of his marriage. He did truly love Bonnie in his own weird, like, dysfunctional way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he he probably had what he considered feelings for her. And um, it's also probably like he feels like he failed and it sounds like he liked being in control. So that's going to affect him, make him sad because he's not in control now. Police began honing in on a suspect in the Sophia Silva murder. Carl Roush was a house painter who had rented an apartment in her neighborhood. Police knew she'd been killed within 48 hours of the abduction, though most of the evidence was obliterated. Remember, she was found floating in water. With some DNA and fibers, investigators were scrutinizing area sex offenders. Roush had been a Marine, and he had a history of petty crimes. Forensic evidence was taken from Roush's van, Physical, chemical, and optical properties from carpeting and seat covers actually matched fibers found on Sophia's body. So a grand jury was convened. Now the thing is, Roush's sister, 16-year-old Susie, had been murdered 19 years earlier in West Virginia, then dumped in a neighboring county. His mother from the beginning said there was no way that Roush could have committed this murder because he was deeply devastated by the death of his sister. Oh, wow. Ron and Patty Lisk lived in Greenwood Estates with their two daughters, Katie and Kristen. Patty was a nurse, and Ron had retired recently from NASA to open up a photo studio. Kristen was finishing up her ninth grade year. She loved horses and took horseback riding lessons. Her younger sister, Katie, played basketball, loved the Goosebumps books, and wanted to make a difference in the world. It was on May 1st of 1997 that Mark called in sick to work at Walter's Grinders. 15-year-old Kristen and 12-year-old Katie had just gotten off the school bus at their home when Mark pulled up in his green Ford Taurus. He yanked Kristen into the car's trunk and then gained control of Katie, forcing her into the trunk as well. He quickly drove them to his home where he backed the car into the garage. Wow. I'm telling this guy is just... um. I mean, it takes a lot of balls to snatch somebody, to kidnap them off of a public street or out of a parking lot or something like that. And it's almost like they're, a guy like this, his impulses get up to a certain point where he just can't control them or doesn't want to control them anymore. And it's like that's what's making all the calls for him. Because, I mean, you got to have some fucking balls, some guts to do something like this. I agree with that. Once inside the house, he forced both girls to undress, leaving Katie in a bathroom. He tied Kristen to the bed where he partially shaved her pubic hair. Mark's erectile dysfunction kept him from being able to sexually assault the girls. 
Now, what we know is sometime after this, he asphyxiated both girls, redressed them, put them back in his Ford Taurus into the trunk. He dumped their bodies 35 miles away in the South Anna River. The following day, May the 2nd, Mark phoned into work again, pretending to be sick. Well, yeah, I guess so. As soon as the girls should have been home from school, their father called to check in as he did daily. When he received no answer, he immediately jumped in the car, drove home. He found an abandoned book bag on the lawn along with one of his daughter's math books. Ron Liss called police to report his daughter's missing. Law enforcement arrived quickly and determined this was not runaway kids. This had been an abduction. 1,500 people in the area joined a search party hoping to find the Lisk sisters. May the 6th was a big day for Mark. Bonnie had sent the divorce summons by mail from California, citing irreconcilable differences as the cause for divorce. Also, a worker found the bodies of the Lisk sisters submerged in water. Really? On the same day that he was served with his divorce papers. Carl Rausch was still being charged in Sophia Silva's murder. Authorities were still convinced he was guilty despite the missing Lisk sisters, and they did not want to believe the cases were connected. Well, I mean, damn. I mean, this is all happening in the same area. It seems like that would give you some pause. And also taking it like, uh, I mean, what's the odds this guy's being accused of doing something to a young girl when his, his own sister was murdered? In, in kind of a similar fashion. Let's pause for a moment, Dylan, take a quick break, and we'll be right back. An FBI profile from Langley released a few details about the killer. The FBI profiler said he was likely a person who'd recently experienced some type of stressful personal event in his life. The killer had a preoccupation with adolescent girls he would likely skip work before and after the abductions. He would also escalate his drug and alcohol use. Damn. Pretty spot on, right? <laughs> wow, that's pretty good. On May 9th, America's Most Wanted featured a segment on the Lisk sisters. It was soon after that police began focusing on a suspect. 18-year-old Jason Talley listened to heavy metal music and liked horror movies. He had recently cut his hair after the Lisk sisters went missing, which was at the urging of his dad and girlfriend because prom was coming up. Oh, so this is a second case Mark has been involved on, is involved in, and has been on America's Most Wanted. Yes. Wow. He knew the Lisk sisters just from the neighborhood. Law enforcement began questioning him, even asking him to take a lie detector test, which the boy agreed to do, and he passed. And though Tally wasn't arrested, he became a prime suspect with law enforcement, and they were all but saying it was just a matter of time before he was arrested for the murders of the Lisk sisters. Uh, so, I'm sorry, it was a matter of time for the young man? This 18-year-old boy. Yeah. That just became a suspect because he liked horror movies and heavy metal. He knew the Lisk sisters That's... from the neighborhood, and because he had recently cut his hair. That sounds, yeah, that sounds hauntingly familiar in some other cases we've heard before. They're just keying in on this young kid because he's got long hair and might wear dark clothes or some shit like that. Right. I just don't get it. Carl Rausch's trial was nearing when prosecutors realized they didn't have enough evidence to convict him. There were also issues with the forensics. On June 16th, it was determined that all the forensic testing that had been performed in that region had to be redone due to mishandling. Wow. Some and employees were fired. Yeah. The state forensic lab. I mean, it was a huge fucking mess. Yeah, I would say that um, they were probably leaning pretty heavily on the supposed matches from the fibers in his van to the victim or the victim's clothing or whatever. 3,000 cases, including that of Sophia Silva, had to be re-examined. It was at this time investigators had to start considering that there was a link between the Silva and the Lisk burners. It's about time. The next year, Mark Evenitz worked on getting a business off the ground. KMK Associates was his new company, and it found itself 
in some deep legal trouble after Mark took his sales client list from his previous employer, which was Walter's Grinders, and began trying to wrangle business away from his former company. Well, yeah, I could see his former bosses uh, not liking that very much. Then his partner pulled out, and Mark ended up filing bankruptcy, losing both his business and the former home he had shared with Bonnie. It was foreclosed on. So he had it all wrapped up in his business venture and lost everything. So, uh, yeah, in just a matter of time, he lost it all. Now, during this time, investigators realized the two cases were the work of the same man. All three girls had been abducted from their homes after school without any struggle. The ritualistic shaving of their pubic hair. All three had been suffocated or strangled, then dumped in water. DNA samples from both crimes matched, although they didn't have a suspect in the database. Yeah, I mean, how creepy and horrible is that? The shave, which of course he's killing them too, which is the most horrible. But just how creepy is that? There's something about that that's really creepy to me. That that is that me too. It just makes my stomach turn like every that time you've said. Really bothered me. Yeah. Every time you've said it, it's just like so disgusting. Ah, I just don't get it. Mark had met 17-year-old Hope Crowley while she was working as a waitress in a Virginia pancake house. The pair married in December of 1999 and moved to South Carolina, kind of near where Mark's family lived. Mark landed a job as director of audit services for Compressor Air Services, which is in Spartanburg, South Carolina, while his new wife worked at PetSmart. The pair lived in an apartment and collected a menagerie of pets. Oh, wow. Pet hoarding. That's always a good thing. Yeah, and that's something that'll come up later in the story. So it was June 23rd of 2002 when Tess, Mark's mother, his niece, and his wife Hope went on a vacation to Orlando, Florida. 15-year-old Kara Robinson was at a friend's house. They were planning to go to the lake when the friend hopped in the shower and asked Kara, Hey, would, do you mind to go outside water these flowers for me while I take the shower? So 15-year-old Kara's like, sure. She goes outside. She's watering flowers for her friend in a residential neighborhood. When Mark Evenitz abducted her at gunpoint. And this is in Columbia, South Carolina. So, yeah, the balls on this guy. You know, I just wish a damn pit bull or something would run. A big shepherd would run out and grab this guy by the throat. He held Kara for nearly 18 hours in his apartment, forcing her to watch movies from his extensive pornography collection. Then pausing only to repeatedly sexually assault the girl. After Mark rapes her a number of times, he begins cleaning up his apartment. Again, he and his wife have, like, all these pets. Oh, yeah, so he's got a wife, a new wife to worry about now. So he's in there cleaning up after the animals, cleaning up the kitchen, and Kara is trying to earn his favor, so she offers to help with some chores, asking, you know, can I do anything? So he tells her to sweep up the kitchen. After the pair straighten up, Mark tells her it's time for bed. He handcuffs her wrists together and uses a C-clamp to, like, tie her hands above her head in the bed. And then he shackles her ankles to a wooden board. Oh, well, that was pretty smart on her on her part to try to kind of win his favor or let him think maybe that she's kind of into him in a, in a way. I think that's very smart. Mark dozes off, and when she can tell he's asleep, He's starting to snore. Kara uses the opportunity to wriggle herself free from the restraints. When she's loose enough to make a run for it, she does, though she still has on the leg restraints and the handcuffs. But the girl manages to run out of the apartment where she finds a 16-year-old boy waiting in the Crossroads apartment complex parking lot. She begs him, please take me to the police department, which he does without hesitation. Kara informs officers that the man had held her captive inside apartment 301. So she knew exactly, she found help very quickly, which is a good thing. And she knew exactly where she was at. You know, some of these cases, people sneak out a window or something. They're in the middle of nowhere. It's dark. They don't know what road it is and all that. But she knew exactly where she had come from in the exact apartment and went straight to the cops. Eight patrol cars are dispatched to the even its apartment. Inside, law enforcement finds a lot of strange stuff, but not Mark Evenitz. 
The man they were after had already managed to flee the scene. After running, Mark phoned his sister Kristen, who helped him get set up at a day's inn in Orangeburg, South Carolina. And he camps out there for like two days. His sister paid in cash, so they couldn't trace Mark to the motel room. So we don't know yet, but I'm going to guess he told his sister some kind of bullshit story. Yeah, that seems to be the case. So with arrest warrants in hand for the kidnapping and first degree criminal sexual conduct, law enforcement swarmed Tessa's home. That's his mother's house. Kristen was there house sitting because, again, her mother was in Florida with Mark's wife and her granddaughter. So she's house sitting when officers knock on the door. Now, at first, Mark's sister couldn't believe the charges against her brother. There was no way that her brother Mark could do the things law enforcement was alleging. When asked if she knew that Mark had been a sex offender in Florida, Kristen was in disbelief. So she wasn't even aware of him being a registered sex offender from another state. He had never told his family anything about the trouble in Florida. Well, yeah, I guess... That it, it was related to any kind of sex case. They thought that he'd, like, gotten a DUI or something. Oh, so he just straight up lied about the entire situation. Yeah, they vaguely knew that he'd gotten into some kind of trouble, but they thought it was something like a DUI. They had no idea it had anything to do with a 15-year-old girl, that it was a sex offense, that he was a registered sex offender. Well, yeah, I mean, long, you know, before the day of connectivity that we live in now... You, you, you wouldn't know those things unless you dug into it or had some kind of a suspicion. Kristen phoned her mother in Florida telling her, you need to come back now. Of course, Tess is demanding to know what's going on. Tess was equally as shocked to hear that police wanted her son. Tess and Hope knew there had to be some kind of mistake. They made reservations to fly back from Orlando. So they're coming home. They don't know exactly coming home what they're coming home to but just some kind of situations going on well they know about the sexual assault the kidnapping but they just don't believe it i mean his wife is like my husband would never do that mom's like mark would never do that well, my i think son that would, would never i think that would be a common reaction for most family members or wives yeah i mean who would want to believe that the by, person you're connected to would do something that horrible. By June 27th, law enforcement was able to get information out of Kristen about the motel in Orangeburg. But by the time they raided the room, Mark had departed. A tracer was placed on his cell phone, and it began showing pings near Jacksonville, Florida. The call was made to Mark's sister, Jennifer, who lived in Bradenton, Florida. Now, during the phone call, Mark begged his sister, Jennifer, for help. When Jennifer asked about the charges, Mark broke down confessing everything he'd done, saying he'd kidnapped, raped, and murdered multiple girls in different states for years. So he came clean, finally. Jennifer agreed to meet her brother at an IHOP restaurant. However, she first called the FBI office in Sarasota, Florida to report the meeting. And by the time she had arrived at the IHOP, there was no sign of Mark. So during his drive to meet his sister at the IHOP, Mark had left several phone messages for his wife, Hope, each growing more desperate. The Sarasota Police Department, who'd been alerted by the FBI, saw Mark's vehicle as he was attempting to approach the IHOP restaurant. A high-speed chase ensued, with Mark speeding up to 120 miles per hour. He had no lights on and was going in the wrong direction which concluded with his car being surrounded on Bayfront Drive in Sarasota. He was ordered out of the vehicle. Instead, Mark stuck a 25 semi-automatic gun in his mouth and refused to exit the car. This was the same gun he'd used to kidnap the girls. Now, eventually, he did open the driver's door, but he would not move out of the vehicle. A four-year-old Belgian Malinois? Oh, yeah. Uh, a canine dog. His name was Matt. Matt the canine. He was released, um, and they were, like, attempting to apprehend Mark. So they released this dog. The dog runs up. It sinks its teeth into Mark's leg and tries to pull him from the vehicle. The dog then clamped down on Mark's elbow and arm, but Mark didn't budge. He still had the weapon lodged between his teeth. As the dog further tried dragging him from the car, Mark pulls the trigger. 
Wow. He slumps over the console and onto the passenger seat. Mark Evenance was dead. And that is justice. You think so? Yeah, I do think so. Yeah, that's horrible. Those things he did to those poor girls, the the rape, the torture, and then the murder. I mean, it it doesn't get much worse than that. I kind of like the idea that the dog bit the shit out of him. Yeah, those Malinois don't play. They're like a daggum German Shepherd's pissed off cousin, in my opinion. Get your ass, Mr. Postman. They're very smart. During the search of his apartment, investigators discovered a great deal of evidence leading detectives to conclude Mark was definitely no first-time offender. A footlocker contained murder trophies like newspaper clippings about the Silva and Lisk murders. Inside the footlocker were also meticulous notes detailing how Evenance had stalked the victims, noting descriptions of the houses, what time the girls arrived home from school, the parents' schedules, and more. There were also directions to the bodies, including that of an unsolved murder, Alicia Showalter Reynolds. There were other notes about young girls he was stalking. Two victims were identified as 17-year-old Laurel Thomas and 16-year-old Catherine Howard. You can only imagine how terrified they were when law enforcement informed them they had been on Mark's radar. Yeah, so they were literally on his list. On his list. On his to-do list. The apartment had over 300 porno videos and hundreds of magazines, mostly featuring shaving, bondage, and even sex with children. There's magazines about shaving? I suppose. Well, I guess there's a magazine about anything you can think of. So that's interesting. I was wondering, when as you were going through your story, if the, if he was stalking, and all that, and then picking the part what he thought was the perfect moment, or if he was just seeing random girls and grabbing them. No, we find out he was actually stalking these girls. So that's why he's been watching them for weeks. He knows the good time when he thinks he can get away with it and get away with them. And that's it, why he felt so emboldened to just snatch them up off the streets. Yeah, in if these you, busy neighborhoods. Yeah, if you know their parents aren't home yet or things like that. Yeah. There were so many porno magazines and videos that they filled the dresser drawers and the couple didn't have any place to store their clothes. Oh, okay. I'm starting that now. Even I'm going to try to help support the paper market because I'm connected to that through my job. And uh, so I'm going to start buying smut rags is what I'm going to call them, baby. And I need you to clear your underwear drawer out and socks because I'm going to start with your drawer. Well, first of all, you know that I have way too many clothing items for that to happen. I barely have storage for my things now. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm the man, and what I say goes, right? Do you hear me laughing maniacally? (laughs) (laughs) As a matter of fact, you're getting shaved later. No, I'm not. Creepy ass shit, that is. I haven't shaved my legs in months. Well, now I'm not going to start. Ooh. <laughs> is that a COVID thing or is that just a... That's, I'm just lazy. You know, well... I'm just the lazy thing. It's your body. You know what? I do not buy into beauty standards, Dylan. You get to do what you want with your body. When you start shaving your pits, I'll start shaving mine. You know, I've wondered if that would help if I shaved my pits. Well, you would look better in a tube top. <laughs> it's true. There were tons of sex toys in the apartment, restraints, and other bondage gear. One of the odd things detectives found was a breast pump, like that a woman would use when she's lactating. Yeah, it's very strange. There were also a number of bras and panties stashed in the footlocker. But one of the key pieces of evidence was a pink bath rug found uh, located in the very bottom of the footlocker. It had pink fibers that would be matched to those found on Katie Lisk's body. Because remember, he had locked her in the bathroom. Oh, yeah. Inside the trunk of Mark's car, investigators found hairs and a number of other traces that Sophia, Katie, and Kristen had been inside the trunk. There were fingerprints and even um, a handprint, a child-sized handprint, which belonged to Katie, inside the trunk. Sad that, how sad that is. DNA samples were matched to the victims. A lengthy list of prescription drugs were found as Mark was taking a lot of medication. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, he's killed himself and I guess in a way robbed the families of, you know, 
seeing their children's murderer in a in, in a courtroom and things like that. Though I would be, I personally would be glad he's dead and he's not going to get to be in prison living his life out. And, um, but yeah, I mean, they've got, this is a treasure trove of evidence. You couldn't ask for any better forensic evidence connecting him to all these victims. One of the prescriptions was also for Viagra and his wife, Hope, admitted that as soon as that became available on the market, Mark was like, right in the doctor's office, making sure he got a prescription. And investigators were able to note that he had raped the last victim, Kara, multiple times, and that it was likely because he had the Viagra prescription. Jesus Christ. During the investigation, his wife, Hope, admitted that Mark was into bondage, often handcuffing her. She also said she forgave him for everything he had done, and if she'd been with him, she would have participated in a murder-suicide along with her husband. Okay, I'm not sure how to respond to that. I found that very troubling. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like you're saying you would have helped him out, helped him through this stuff. I mean, granted, she's probably like 19 or 20 years old at this time. I don't but, care. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was very disturbing. A task force was created to look into other unsolved rapes and murders in locations where Mark had lived, including Florida, Maine, California, Virginia, and South Carolina. And as I mentioned before, investigators believe he may have been responsible for the murder of Alicia Showalter Reynolds in Culpeper, Virginia in 1996, as he had directions basically leading where her body had been discovered. Well, yeah, I mean, that's an easy connection to make if if he had that in his possession. She was a married college student who had actually driven down, I believe, to Charlottesville. She was going to meet her sister for shopping when she went missing and then was murdered and found, you know, sometime later. An FBI profiler named Gary McCrary said of Mark Evenitz that often psychopathic offenders will commit suicide um, out of control. They're not going to submit to authorities or society, and Mark would not allow us that victory of arresting him. Well, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Is this when um, this task force, um, did they connect the rapes of those poor little girls or that poor little girl to him through that? Yeah, they were able to connect that he was likely responsible for raping the 13-year-old when he broke into the house. Um, but they also looked into some other cases. There was Jessica Carpenter, I believe was her name, that was murdered in South Carolina in the late 90s. And they tried to connect Mark to that, but the DNA evidence didn't come back. I actually covered Jessica's case on a Patreon episode. Um, but yeah, they were really working hard trying to connect him to cases possibly out of Norfolk, Virginia, um, where he'd been in some training up in Maine. Well, I don't blame him because there's no telling what what all he got into. Right. And because he had told his sister on the phone, I've done this in multiple states. Right. Which led authorities to believe there are more out there. So his sister, she was helping him. And then she finds she's helping put him up in a hotel, you know, whatever. Well, that's his sister, Kristen. Right. And then she, you know, hears these charges. The police make contact and like he's being charged. We want to talk to him. He's being charged with these horrible things, but she didn't believe it until he broke down and basically confessed to her. Well, no, he confessed to his other sister, Jennifer. Oh, his other sister, Jennifer. The one that lived in Florida. Oh, yeah. Okay. He has two sisters. Okay. Kara Robinson Chamberlain, the only surviving victim, went on to work with Richland County Sheriff's Office as a school resource officer and now with Victim Services. She's active on TikTok where she often shares her story, including tips for keeping safe, how to handle PTSD, and she answers questions for people. She's also a motivational speaker who appeared on a Lifetime special called Smart Justice that was uh, featuring other survivors like Elizabeth Smart, Katie Beers, and Gina DeSeuss. Um, she plans to release a documentary in the future about her kidnapping and experience with Mark Evenitz. Yeah, that's very admirable that she's taken this and, you know, turned it into a positive in a way to help other victims and stuff like that. In an interview with BuzzFeed, she said, Bad things can happen, but it's not the end of the world. We get to choose when something negative happens. Do we let it destroy us or do we let it make us a stronger person? Wow. 
That's a hell of a woman right there. Yeah, if you want to find her account on TikTok, it's very interesting, uplifting. Um, her name is Kara Robinson Chamberlain. That's her screen name on TikTok, so you can find her. I mean, she is, I mean, pretty amazing person. Yeah, I might look her up. Yeah. Um, resources I used for today's story include the book Into the Water by Diane Fanning and there were numerous newspaper articles from the Washington Post, uh, local newspapers in Virginia, around Spotsylvania, South Carolina newspapers. So a lot of information out there. Well, yeah, it sounded like a pretty big deal in those areas in the, when it was happening. Most definitely. Yeah, so if you just can't get enough of us, check us out on Patreon. And you can check us out on TikTok and such. Oh, yeah. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. There's those things. Mountain Murders. All you got to do is give us a little search. And you can email us if you have information, want to give us a critique, got a story you want to suggest, mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. Oh, yeah. Send us a cool email. We need one of those lately. We need a cool email? Yup. You can also hit subscribe. And if you're feeling froggy, leave us a five-star review wherever you download. Yes, and don't forget, if you can't get enough of us being a little goofy and talking about weird stuff, you can check us out on our new podcast, Bat Shit Crazy. That's right, Dylan. It's available on Spotify. I'm still trying to work out some issues with Apple. For some reason, it's not going there. Apple's trying to hold <laughs> us down. Apple, yeah, I know. I say that in a in not very articulate way. Apple is uh, not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's woke. It is broke. My apple is broke. But you can find Back Shit Crazy on Spotify as well as Podchaser, CastBox, and a lot of other places where you can download. Okay, is that it, Dylan? Are we wrapping things up? Yeah, I think I fumbled my way through most of it. Okay, same here. All right, you guys have a great week.